sight of them. Lord, I will praise you with all of my heart. How marvelous the works you do. Search me, O oh God, know all of my heart. Try me. says it's appointed a man once to die and after this comes the judgment are you ready to be judged by God are you ready to give an account to God of your life how you've lived your life the Bible makes it clear you'll do so you'll give an account to God for whether you've done righteously or not you can account for all things done in the body, whether good or evil. So you need to prepare yourself to get ready. You prepare yourself for future jobs by coming to school. You need to prepare yourself for future life by getting right with God. Because Judgment Day is coming whether you want it to or not, whether you like it to or not, and on that day, God will judge you in righteousness. So it behooves you to get right with God, to give up whatever sins you have in your life, to give them all up, and to follow Jesus Christ. Are you following Jesus today? Are you living for Jesus today? Or are you living for yourself? You know, what, what do you, what's the first thing you think about when you wake up? Is it Jesus Christ and giving him thanks for your life, giving him thanks for breath in your lungs. What, what's the last thing you think about when you go to sleep? A lot of people think about what kind of fun they're going to have that day or what kind of fun they had that day. You need to think about the guilt and shame you should have for your sins and how God wants you to stop that and to follow him instead. That's God's desire for you, is that you'd have a holy relationship with Him. As long as you're a sinner living in sin, no matter what your sin is, you can't have a relationship with God, because God will not have a relationship with a sinner. He is holy, and He requires you to be holy. It'd be like having a, a good relationship with someone who's beating you, someone who hates you. So God commands you to follow Him. He sent His Son to die for you on the cross that you might be forgiven of your sins and made holy, that you might have salvation. Jesus said you must be born again or you cannot see, you cannot enter, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You must be born again. And being born again isn't getting baptized as a baby. Being born again is not asking Jesus into your heart. Being born again is forsaking all of your sins and following Jesus Christ in holiness. And when you decide to forsake all of your sins and you begin to follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you he cleanses your heart, your mind, your conscience, and He gives you new desires. He gives you sort of like a super conscience to help you and guide you and direct you in life. So are you born again of the Holy Spirit today? Are you following Jesus Christ in holiness? Or are you sinning every day? Well, going to church isn't going to help on Judgment Day if you're sinning. You have to stop your sinning. You can't be a sinner and have church help you because the whole goal of church is to perfect the saints. If you're not being perfected, then you miss the whole goal of church. That's the whole point of uh, pastors and apostles and prophets and evangelists 
is to perfect the saints, that they wouldn't be tossed to and fro like every wave of the sea when the wind blows. You know, so if you're going to a church that tells you you can be a sinner and be a Christian, you should flee that church. That church will lead to the damnation of your soul. You need to instead follow people who actually follow Jesus. You know, the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, so what he's saying is, if I'm not following Christ, you shouldn't follow me. Well, I said the same thing. Every Christian, especially leaders, should want to say the same thing. Follow me as I follow Christ. So if I do something that's not following Christ, you shouldn't follow that because it'll lead to your destruction. The Bible says every man and woman will reap what they sow. You know, if I go into a farm field and sow some tobacco seeds there, I'm going to have tobacco leaves, which will lead to my destruction. If I sow some uh, GMO corn seed, I shouldn't expect to get organic corn. You know, if I, if I sow some apple seed, I should expect an apple tree. If you sow to your flesh through sitting, you should expect destruction. You should expect corruption. You should expect nothing but guilt and shame and misery. You shouldn't expect good things when you're sinning. So many people, they, they're involved in a relationship where they're fornicating with their boyfriend or girlfriend. They're expecting to have some kind of fairy tale ending. But then their boyfriend or girlfriend dumps them for something they perceive to be better or nicer or better looking or has more money. And they get upset when they don't have a fairy tale ending. They shall live happily ever after. Well, why should you expect a fairy tale ending when you're in sin yourself? You need to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And the word blessed there in the Greek is makarios, and it means happy, blissful. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So if you're hungering and thirsting for sin, first of all, you're not blessed. Secondly, you will not be satisfied or filled, fulfilled. You're going to be uh, unfulfilled, unsatisfied. You're going to lack blessing, which is cursing. So you can say, cursed are those who hunger and thirst for wickedness and sin, for they shall not be satisfied. You know, any promise you see in God's word, the opposite is also true. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for purity, for they shall be satisfied. Cursed are those who hunger and thirst for sexual immorality, for they shall not be satisfied or fulfilled. So, I mean, you are made in God's image. You are made to live a certain way, to be a certain way. And as long as you reject that way that God has prescribed for you as a human being, that you won't have a blessed or happy life, You'll have a miserable life. Now, you might have little patches of happiness here and there because you're basing your emotion upon what is happening to you. But the happiness I talk about is not based upon the circumstances around you. It's based upon what's happening within you, which is from the Holy Spirit. The joy. Uh, as the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. That's what you get from the Holy Spirit. But as long as you're following not the Holy Spirit, but you're following evil spirits, then uh, you're not going to have love, true love. You're not going to have true joy or true peace in life because you're following spirits that are not holy, that uh, they're wicked spirits who, who yearn for your destruction, not for your eternal life. And so God commands you to repent. He commands you to give up all of your sinning and to follow Jesus. To become born again of the Holy Spirit. You need Jesus. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. Yes, I know. I believe that 100%. Do you follow Jesus? Yes, I do. Are, are you sinning every day? Uh, I sin every now and then. Oh, every now and then. Well... Being human doesn't mean you have to sin. No, it doesn't mean you have to, but it also means you're not God-like. I mean, you strive to be Jesus-like. Yeah. But it doesn't mean 
you're going to make it every day. Well, I mean, you can make it because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If you walk according to the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if we do sin, it's not God's fault for the way He made us. It's not Adam's fault or Eve's fault or our parents' fault or the world's fault. It's our fault because we chose to give in to temptation that God allowed us to have and oh, yeah. He gave us a way out of it, right? So we never have to give in to temptation. Well, I mean, I strive not to, but I'm not yeah. going to say I'm perfect. Yeah, well, the Bible says to pluck out the eye and cut off the hand and cut off the foot if it causes you to sin. So whatever is in your life that's leading to temptation, which is leading to that sin, I would encourage you to cut it off, to cut it out of your life. You know, a lot of men have a problem with pornography. And so I'm not saying that's your problem, but a lot of people have that problem. So I, I encourage, listen, well, get rid of your smartphone, get rid of your computer or internet, or at least get a, some kind of filter. Yeah, so you need to, that's what Jesus said. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean cut off your hand. It means cut no, off your hand. Jesus isn't endorsing, endorsing right. mutilation, but he's, he's saying take drastic measures right. to get the sin, because sin costs you your soul. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The ways of sin is death. So we don't, I'm, I'm Catholic, so you probably. Well, they need to be born again then, sir. I, I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to heaven. Well, this is what Jesus said in John 3. You must be born again, or you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the words of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. So if you are truly following Jesus, you must be born again. You must born again. born again means you've forsaken all of your sins at some point in time in your life. You've begun to follow Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. Okay. I mean, we, we have a similar concept, but I mean, it's, I don't think we call it. Well, it's not confirmation. That's not being born no, again. Not uh, baptism when, is not. When you're baptized, you are baptized. I mean, you're, you're born again. Well, you can be born again when you're baptized, but if you, if you haven't forsaken all of your sins and trusted in Jesus for salvation, when you get baptized, you become a wet sinner. It's just like taking a shower in your house. <laughs> Be being baptized must mean something because well, yeah, you've died you to your old that. life of sin, well, I mean, and you raised a new life. Line them up, okay, you're Catholic, let's get baptized. It I mean, you have, you're going up there for a reason. Right, but it, it has to be a, a decisive moment in your life just like there was a in your first birth. Well, when, I mean, when I was a Baptist when I was a kid, my uh, kids were going up there getting baptized because that's what their grandmothers wanted them. Well, that's that's not right either. I'm not I'm not advocating Baptist churches right. or Roman Catholic churches or any kind of Protestant church. Right. I'm just simply advocating what the Bible says. Well, and I so, mean, as far as I know, I, I follow the Bible. I mean, okay. if the Bible is open to the interpretation. Your interpretation might not be what our the leaders of our church interpreted. Uh, sure, I, I understand. Doesn't, doesn't mean you're going to hell. Doesn't mean we're going to hell. Doesn't mean uh, you can't be forgiven of your sins. Doesn't mean we can't be forgiven of our sins. I mean, you know, it's. I'm not advocating any denomination. I'm simply advocating what the Bible right. says. I understand and people I, have you know, I, twisted not, the Bible and I make. A lot of Catholics that think if you're not Catholic, you know, you're, you sure. don't have a chance. I don't believe that. Well, I, I don't. I don't. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church started around 400, 500 A.D. Yeah. Uh, the early church fathers didn't believe in a lot. Most of the things the Roman Catholics believe in today that distinguish them from the Protestants. But the Protestants have lots of messed up stuff too. And so I'm not advocating either. I'm simply just saying, you know, understand the Bible and follow the Bible and obey the Bible. Good luck to you. Okay, well, God bless you, sir. I hope you, I hope hope you become born again. If you really aren't born again, really seek this out. Thank really you. really think about this, okay? All right. Okay, what was you your name? Good work. John Sackett. John Kerrigan. Kerrigan. Nice okay, John. Me, I'll be praying for you, okay? All right, you too. And so God commands you to repent of all your sins, follow Jesus. You can become born again of the Holy Spirit. Uh, not just of water, but of the Spirit, because uh, the Spirit is the one who seals you to the day of redemption, the one who puts the, the seal of God upon you, the mark of ownership from God upon you. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who cleanses your heart and your mind and your conscience. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives you a new heart. That's what you need, you need a new heart, because... Uh, up until this point, if you're not born again, you've just lived in sin and you have a bad heart. Not, not physical heart, but a bad spiritual heart. You, you have a sinful heart. And so God commands you to repent of your sinful heart and to follow Him. And He, he uh, promises to do something if you'll do something. If you'll uh, seek the Lord while He may be found. If you'll, please, if you'll call upon Him while He is near and you forsake your wicked ways and your unrighteous thoughts, then you can have mercy from God. Then you can have abundant pardon from God. So God gives to you the Word of God, 
because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And when you've heard the Word of God, you can have uh, faith and believe it and obey it and have salvation uh, through His name. So that's what God commands you to do. He commands you to follow Him and serve Him. Yes, you need to be born again of the Holy Spirit. You need to follow Jesus Christ. He died for you on the cross. Once you live for Him, once you live for Jesus Christ, He's never wronged you. He's always done what's best for you. He shed His blood for you that you might have salvation. He died for you that He might destroy the works of the devil in your life. He died for you so you'd stop being a sinner. That's why Jesus died for you. That you might uh, be holy. That you might be what you are meant to be in the first place. A child of God. Uh, 1 John 3.10 says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. You know, so many people, they think they're a child of God by default. Not true. Some people think they're a child of God because their parents were Christians. Not true. Some people think they're a child of God because they have a pastor in their family. Not true. Some people think they're a child of God because uh, they've been baptized. Not true. To be a child of God, you must be righteous. You must be righteous by faith and by practice. Not one or the other, but by both. You become righteous by faith, by forsaking your sins and trusting the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for you. You become righteous by practice, by stopping your sinning and living holy. You must live holy. Without holiness, no man will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Yeah, so you need to be born again of the Holy Spirit. You need to follow Jesus Christ in righteousness. To obey Him with your whole heart, all your mind, all your strength. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because fornicators and drunkards and drug users will not inherit God's kingdom. Porn watchers and lustful people won't inherit God's kingdom. Homosexuals and sodomites will end up in hell in the end. That's why we're here to call you to repentance that you might have life. Because Jesus Christ, and you know, God takes no delight in the death of the wicked because the wicked, when they die, they go to hell. But he takes delight in the death of the saints, the holy people, the righteous people. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but rather, rather than them dying, that they turn and live. And then when they turn and live, they can die physically because God will take delight in that. And God wants you to live a righteous life because it says, Do not be deceived. The unrighteous will not, will not inherit God's kingdom. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor drunkards, nor thieves, nor covetous, and nor revelers will inherit God's kingdom. So many people are deceived into thinking that the unrighteous can inherit God's kingdom. That's the very reason why the Holy Spirit led the Apostle Paul to write 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, to make sure that people wouldn't be deceived. That they wouldn't be deceived into thinking they could be unrighteous and still inherit God's kingdom. If you're living in sin, you can't inherit God's kingdom. If you're sinning every day, you are not going to inherit God's kingdom. You need to forsake your sins. You need to stop being a sinner. Jesus Christ said, go and sin no more. And he meant it. He meant it. He wants you to go and sin no more. Not go and sin some more. Not go and try to sin no more but fail every day. But go and sin no more. And that's what God expects out of you. And that's what you ought to do. You ought to go and sin no more. If you care about your soul, 
If you care about your own life and where you're going to spend eternity, then you will go and sin no more. If you really tru truly care about what God thinks and how God feels, then you will go and sin no more. But the longer you continue in sin, no matter what your sin is, the harder your heart will get, the uh, more wrath you heap up for yourself, the more condemnation you'll have on Judgment Day if you continue in your sin. But if you forsake your sin, God is willing, He's able to cleanse you of all your sins, to forgive you of all your sins, to treat you like you don't deserve, which is with grace and mercy and compassion and kindness. That's what God offers to you. But you need to understand, young people, that fornicators, those having sex outside of marriage, will not inherit God's kingdom. You need to understand that drunkards, those guzzling down the beer, or wine coolers, or whatever else, whatever alcoholic drink of preference you have, if you're getting drunk, you're getting buzzed, or tipsy, or wasted, you're not going to inherit God's kingdom. God commands you to be sober-minded, not drunk, sober-minded. God commands you to be pure, not sexually immoral. The only uh, way God has provided for you to fulfill your sexual desires is to be in a monogamous marital relationship with someone of the opposite sex. It's called holy matrimony. It's called marriage. And that's the only way God has provided for you to fulfill your sexual desires which are given to you by God. Fulfilling your sexual desires in other ways, like looking at pornography, uh, sex outside of marriage, sodomy, uh, whatever your preference is, they're not good enough. You're breaking God's standards. You're breaking God's boundaries, God's rules. And God expects you to stop that. Or you'll face the consequences of your actions. The consequence of being a fornicator is inheriting hell, not God's kingdom. The Bible says, For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor a covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. The Bible also says that bad company corrupts good character. Therefore awake unto righteousness and do not sin. You know, when I was a sinner, I hung around other sinners. When I became a Christian, I stopped hanging around the same people because I realized they would probably just drag me down. You know, the Bible says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? None. What fellowship does Christ have with the devil? None. You know, and so, if you are light, you should have no fellowship with darkness. You need to forsake your sins. You need to follow Jesus Christ. You know, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. If you truly are a Christian, you won't have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You're not going to hang around people who are engaging in sin. You're going to stop your sinning and follow Jesus. And if you're following Jesus, he won't lead you to sin again. So if you're following Jesus, you're not sinning. If you're sinning, you're not following Jesus. Yeah, so there's lots of things God wants you to stop. There's also a lot of things God wants you to start. It's not just about stopping things, it's about starting things too. Starting to live holy. Starting to live pure and chaste as God commands. So Jesus said, unless you repent, you will perish. And another way of putting that is turn or burn, uh, or comply or fry. All different ways you can put that, but you need to obey God. You need to repent. 
And repentance is not a bad thing. Sinners look at repentance as a dirty word. But the Bible says, repent therefore and be converted, that your sins might be blotted out, that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. So, lots of good things can happen from repentance to repentance. You'll have pardon. You'll have your sins blotted out. And times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. God, See, God wants to give you refreshing. He wants to give you pardon. He wants to blot out your sins. As long as you stay in your sins, your sins will not be blotted out. They'll stay on your record and you'll be in big trouble. There won't be times of refreshing coming from the presence of the Lord if you choose to remain a sinner. There's no good reason to be a sinner. None at all. Sin just leads to guilt and shame as long as your conscience is still working properly. It leads to guilt and shame. Uh, sin leads to destruction in the here and now and destruction in the hereafter. And so there's no good reason to, for example, be a sodomite. No reason for men to sodomize other men. It just destroys their life. You know, the average age of death, the average life expectancy for a sodomite man is about 42 years old. 42 years old is the average life expectancy for an active sodomite man. Well, an active heterosexual man, whether he's fornicating or not, the average life expectancy is 72 years old. So just by being a sodomite, sodomite man, you cut off, on average, 30 years of your life. It could be more, could be less, but the point being that, on average, sodomite men are killing themselves. But just like other fornicators are killing themselves, too, by getting other STDs, other STIs, whether it be herpes or syphilis or gonorrhea, crabs, HIV, AIDS. Not all these will kill you, but lots of them can. And some of them you can never get rid of. And the Bible says that one, and, or not the Bible, but statistics say that one in every four fornicators has an STD. It's not a very good percentage. If I told you that by going to a certain place that one out of every four of you would get a heinous disease that would affect the rest of your life, you probably wouldn't go to that place. But yet, there are still fornicators. There are still people having sex outside of marriage, even though there's some really bad results from that. And, uh, you know, the worst thing that can happen to any fornicator is not getting herpes or crabs or syphilis or gonorrhea or HIV AIDS, uh, the worst thing that can happen to a sexually immoral person is to end up in the lake of fire because of their sins. To die in their sin and then go to hell for their sins. That's the worst thing that can happen to a fornicator is that they end up in the lake of fire. They end up in hell for being a fornicator. You know, Many fornicators have bought into this idea of safe sex. They think as long as they put a condom on, they're having sex safely. Uh, but you forgot one thing, you know, condoms may protect you from syphilis and it may protect you from gonorrhea and crabs and herpes and AIDS. Uh, but one thing, there was one STD that condoms will not protect you from, for all you fornicators, and that is sexually transmitted damnation. Every time you fornicate, you heap up for yourself sexually transmitted damnation. Because you heap the wrath of God upon yourself. Because you're not doing what God allows you to do. Condoms don't protect you from God's wrath. Condoms don't protect you from God's judgment and judgment day. You won't be able to go before God on judgment day and say, put a condom over yourself and be protected from the flames of hell. 
Oh no, not like that. So don't deceive yourself, don't delude yourself. No matter how many sexually transmitted infections, diseases you protect yourself from, God's still watching. For the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Proverbs 15, 3, Job 34, 21 to 22. For his eyes are on the ways of man, and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. You can't hide your sin from God. You can hide your sin from the people who are closest to you on earth, but you can't hide it from God. You say amen, are you still sinning? Well then why are you saying amen? God sees your sin, you shouldn't amen that. You're in trouble if you're a sinner. I don't sin. I obey God. I follow God. So I can say amen to God seeing everything I do. But if you're in sin, you can't say amen to everything that God sees you do because it just destroys you, sends you to hell. Whether it's sex outside of marriage or drunkenness or pot smoking or cigarette smoking, your sin's going to cost you your soul. It's not a funny thing. It's not a light thing. It's a very heavy thing. It's a very burdened thing, but Jesus offers a, a light burden and an easy yoke. If you'll but come to him, humble yourselves, and repent. So God sees your whole life, not just today or last week or last month or last year, but your whole life. And God doesn't just see your deeds, your acts, God sees your word. He knows about every word that come out of your mouth. <laughs> Jesus said, but I say unto you that for every idle word men may speak, they'll give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37. Hebrews 4.13 says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked, all things are open to the eyes of him to whom he must give an account. So God sees your whole life. That's a scary thing. That's a fearful thing to know that God knows about all your thoughts, all your words, all your deeds, and he's going to bring it all into the judgment and judge you for your whole life, that should cause some trembling within you. You know, devils tremble because they know who God is. If the devils tremble and they know who God is, surely we should tremble. You know, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Yeah, God wants to turn you away from the snares of death. And that can happen by fearing God. The Bible says in mercy and truth, atonement, that's Jesus, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. You need to depart from evil. You need to fear God and depart from evil. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't fear God, you're not wise. Hey, what you Can't do nothing without Jesus. Well, why you got a cigarette in your hand if you can't do anything without Jesus? You put that down and throw it away. You said what? That cigarette. You need to well, get rid of it. The Bible says what you believe harms you is bad for you, but if you believe it's good for you. Give me a chapter and verse for that. What believes okay. what you believe harms you harms you. Are you claiming to be a Christian? I am a Christian. Well, then you know that if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, right? Yeah. So you're a te temple. so you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, yeah, but what, and you're you're destroying your temple. But you're supposed to have a personal relationship with God. So how how, how can you have a personal mind? relationship with God if you're sinning? God doesn't have God doesn't have God doesn't have a per hold on a second God doesn't hold on a second God doesn't have a personal relationship with sinners. 
doesn't have he a has a relationship with sinners. No, he, he is. No, actually, strike that, strike that, strike that. He does. He does have a personal relation with sinners. It's one of judge. That's what. That's his relation with sinners. God's relationship with sinners is as judge. That's God's relation with sinners. He's going to judge you. And we know we know why sinners walk away because they love their sin. You don't, you love your cigarette more than you love Jesus. That's part of your problem. You love you every time you puff on that cigarette, you breathe in death and breathe out life. Those pink lungs were not made for nicotine and smoke and tar. Those pink lungs are made for oxygen. I know this is basic stuff. Maybe they didn't teach you in science class. But lungs are made for oxygen, not for tar and cigarette smoke and black and mild smoke or anything like that. It's made for oxygen. That's what it's made for. But God does have a personal, intimate relationship with sinners. It's one as judge. And it's very personal. It's very intimate because God knows everything about you. Even the things you wish he didn't know about, he knows about them. And he's going to judge you for them. You know, the Bible says that God does not even pay attention or hear the prayers of sinners. He said if you regard iniquity in your heart, he doesn't even hear your prayers. Many people will say, well, I'm going to go out and fornicate tonight and get drunk and revel and party, and I'll go home tonight and say, I'm sorry, Jesus. And you know what Jesus will say? I'm not going to forgive you until you stop it. Stop your sinning. Stop your rebellion, or I'm not going to forgive you. God is not a fool. You cannot mock God. He's not a fool. God will not be mocked. He knows your wickedness. He knows your depravity. And he will only forgive you if you're truly repentant. If you truly forsake all your sins. If you truly surrender your whole life. You know, Jesus said in Mark 8, he said, If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Forever desires to save his life will lose it. Forever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels shall save it. And what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul in the end? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me and my words, it's adulterous and sinful generation of you. The Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So many people don't want to give their life up, their precious life up to Jesus. They want to do what they want to do instead. They're not... Uh, they're ashamed of Jesus and his words. They're not willing to take up their cross and follow him. They rather take up their sin and follow the devil than take up their cross and follow Jesus. And if you were following Jesus, you wouldn't be a fornicator. You wouldn't be a pot smoker. You wouldn't be lustful. You wouldn't be a drunkard, because if you're following Jesus, he does not lead you to do such things. People claim to have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. But pay attention. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit won't lead you to be unholy. And the Holy Spirit will not dwell in a filthy temple. The Holy Spirit will only dwell in a righteous temple. So the Holy Spirit will lead you in holiness. 
I know this is difficult for some people to understand, but it seems pretty elementary to me. It may be difficult to understand because you've been taught so many other false teachings. You may have been taught that we all sin every day, we can't help it, we're going to sin to the day we die, and then when we die, bam, we're holy all of a sudden. Not what the Bible teaches. Not the Bible teaches at all. The Bible says, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows who are his. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, I, I've flown on hundreds of airplanes in my day, and when an airplane departs from an airport, it doesn't leave a wing behind or an engine behind. The whole plane takes off. And when the Bible says you must depart from iniquity to name the name of Christ, it means all of your iniquity. Not just some of it. You have to depart from all of it. If you hang on to any sin at all, you cannot have Jesus as your Savior. Because Jesus saves from sin. Not in sin, from sin. The Bible says, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil in your life. So many of you, you hinder the work of Jesus. You're against the work of Jesus because the work of Jesus in your life is to destroy the devil's work, to destroy the sinning, to get it out of your life, to put an end to it once and for all. Not that you keep on doing it and saying you're sorry and keep on doing it and saying you're sorry and keep on doing it and saying you're sorry. This vicious circle that God never wanted you to be on in the first place. And you show you really aren't sorry because you keep going back to it. How can you tell someone you're sorry to keep punching them in the face over and over again? And that's what you do when you, sin, when you sin against God. You keep punching God in the face and telling him, sorry God, sorry God, sorry God, sorry God. You're not really sorry. If you're sorry, you stop it. You give it up. You cut off the hand. You cut off the foot. You pluck out the eye. You do whatever it takes to get the sin out of your life if you really were sorry. But you prove you're not sorry by continuing to do it. The Bible says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doing from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool, if you are willing and obedient. See, God's forgiveness is conditional. God's salvation is conditional upon your stopping it. Just stop it already. No good reason to keep doing what you're doing. No good reason to be a fornicator. No good reason to be a drunkard. No good reason to be a pot smoker. No good reason to dress immodestly. No good reason to be a liar or a thief or a covetous. You know, we have National Covetous Day coming up soon. People call it Christmas. I call it National Covetous Day, where people say, give me, give me, give me, give me. Mine, 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 mine. People beat each other up for toys for their children. They rack up debt on credit cards and thousands of dollars just to buy toys for kids. What a foolish thing to do. National Covetous Day. They lie to the children by this mythical figure called Santa Claus. 
who supposedly goes throughout all the world in one night, goes down chimneys, even though he weighs 300 pounds, eats lots of cookies, gives good little children presents and bad little children sticks and coal. What a bunch of nonsense. And people, they feed this garbage to their children. They lie to their children. Even though the Bible says liars will go to hell. People lie to their children. These, these precious little children who basically believe anything you tell them and you, you, uh, you destroy that trust by lying to them. <clears throat> and you produce in them covetousness because you're lying to them and causing them to become covetous. And so, most people coming up will celebrate National Covetous Day. And they'll put up these trees inside their house and decorate it with lights and put lights on their house. And everyone will be covetous whether they believe in Santa Claus or not. And they'll call it Christmas, but it has nothing to do with Christ. Christ wasn't born December 25th. He was probably born the end of September. And he never told you to celebrate his birth. He never told you to give presents to each other on his birth and be covetous about it. But it's the only day of the year that some people even remotely think of Jesus. But the problem is they think of him as a baby in a manger. Jesus is no longer in the manger. He's no longer even on the cross. He's no longer in the tomb. He's at the right hand of the Father, and the next time you'll see him will be a terrible day for sinners. The next time sinners see Jesus, it won't be a nativity scene. It won't be a crucifix with blood and crown of thorns. It'll be as a conquering king coming to punish the wicked. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9, that when Christ returned with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these he shall punish with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So you need to stop thinking of Jesus as some guy on a cross with a crown of thorns on his head being beaten and bruised. That's done. That's over with. And many of you don't allow that cross to affect you in a good way. The Bible says he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. So, one of the main points, one of the main purposes of Christ dying for you was not to have Easter bunnies in an Easter basket, but was so you can stop your sinning. So you can stop living for yourself and start living for Jesus Christ, the one who died for you. Can you do me one favor? Will you, will you open that Bible? You're not going to give me direction on how to preach, sir. If you, have, if you have a question, I'll take your question and answer your question. My question is then, will you please read a verse from the Bible? Matthew 7, 1? No. Okay, which one is it? Open, no, no tell, me what, it. tell me what it is. I want you, it don't matter. Tell I me what the verse is. You can discern any verse. I've been okay. quoting Bible verse to you over and over again. You know. Okay. I know lots of Bible verses I haven't well, quoted yet. You, if you can quote the one, you can quote them all. Open it. Don't do say it. you're telling me how to preach. You're not you're asking me a question. You said open it. You to, to I'm telling you, I have God's open word it. written upon my heart. Open it. You know what your problem it. is? You don't agree with what I've already read quoted. It. That's your problem. You don't agree with what I already have quoted. Open the book no. And you're telling. So you're telling me what to do again. You I don't take orders from you. 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 You don't. You don't give me orders. You don't give me orders. So God commands all men everywhere to repent. God commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. You're telling me what to do again, sir. I don't take orders from you. Blessed is the man who walks not 
and the council. I open it every day. You're a liar. Blessed is a man who walks not in the council of the ungodly. You're ungodly. I don't take counsel from you. Yes, liars will go to hell. Drunkards will go to hell. Fornicators will go to hell. Thieves will go to hell. Read the word. I read. No, you're ordering me around again. I don't take orders from you. I've already told you that. I don't take counsel from the ungodly. You've already proved when you're ungodly. Me. I don't have to. I know what came out of your mouth. Read the word. I know what came out of your mouth. Read the word. I know what came out of your mouth, and you justify your sin. You need to repent of your sin. Stop justifying your sin and repent of your sin instead. So let me ask you this. I'm not trying to like, argue with you, man, but what's, what's your purpose for today? Preach the Bible. The Holy Bible. The one Bible. Yes, the Holy Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by holy men of old, which commands you to be holy and stop being a sinner. So you're not a part of the Mormon church or anything? No, of course not. I'm a Christian. Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, you, don't, you don't like the scriptures I preach because they're against your sin. They're against your sin. You love your sin. You want a Bible, you can take a black magic marker and scratch out all the verse I've pointed to you. I read my Bible every day, sinner. I'm not here to read my Bible. I'm here to preach the Bible to you, sinner. I'm here to preach the Bible to you, sinner, that you might repent, that you might repent, that you might get right with God, that you might stop your sinning, stop trying to justify yourself before God when you have no justification. Oh, I don't have to read it. I don't take orders from you, sinner. You don't tell me what to do. No, he's not. You're not God. You're a sinner. God doesn't talk through sinners. You're a sinner. God doesn't talk through sinners. Proverbs 15, 9. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But he who loves him follows righteousness. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Are you wicked? Yeah, are you wicked? You're straight? You're good. The Bible says no one is good. Uh-huh. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But he who loves him follows righteousness. Follows righteousness. Uh, you're not a disciple. You're a disciple of the devil. So you're a disciple of... 1 John 3.10 says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. If you don't practice righteousness, if you are living in sin instead, you're a child of the devil, according to God's word. Not a child of God. A child of God obeys God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you to do. He said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, and it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. That's John 14, 15, John 15, 14, and John 14, 21. So those who claim to love Jesus claim to be a friend of Jesus, but don't actually follow Jesus, are liars. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 3 through 4, basic Christianity, 1, 2, 3, 4. 1 John 2, 3 through 4. Now by this, we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. That's the Bible. Basic Christianity. If you don't got this down, you're never going to get Christianity down. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1 John 2, 3 through 4. Now by this, we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, 
and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, little bonus here, verse 5, whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know we are in him. Yes, if you want to know you know him, if you want to know you're in him, you need to be obeying him. If you're not obeying him, you don't know him. You're not in him. You're a liar if you claim to know him, if you're not obeying him. And the Bible says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So, you're a son of God if you're led by the Spirit of God. Wow, you ripped a piece of paper. Did you go to the gym tonight? You ripped a piece of paper up. Wow, you're so strong. You're so strong. You're so powerful. Could you rip the piece of paper in four pieces and threw it on the grass? God is not impressed with you, sinner. He's not impressed with you. He's not impressed with your strength. He's not impressed with your pride. God's not impressed with you, sinner. God's not impressed with your strength or your pride. Doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. It doesn't make him go away. You think your lack of belief makes God go away? You think your lack of belief in God makes him go away? I'm talking to him right now. You need to forsake your sin, sinner. The Bible calls you a fool because you deny the obvious. You deny the obvious. God does exist. God will punish sinners, and you're one of them. You ought to get right with God. You ought to give up your sin and follow Jesus Christ. Sinners will end up in hell. You suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And your defiance against God and his word and his servants are not going to do you any good on Judgment Day. No good at all. You need Jesus Christ. You know, follow him and serve him. You need Jesus Christ. You need to realize that you're a hell-deserving sinner. You need to realize that if you're a sinner, you're on your way to hell. This camp is not owned by you, Mr. Sinner. This campus deed does not have your name on it. This camp is paid for in part by public tax dollars. I'm a part of the public and I'm a taxpayer. I deserve to be here just as much as you do. Whether you want it, believe it or not. Jesus Christ said, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. First Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 11, says, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. No. Ephesians 5, 11 says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Rather reprove them. 1 Timothy 2.11, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Silence. 1 Timothy 2.11 and 12, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. 
I wonder how many Bible-believing women actually believe the Bible, actually obey the Bible, or do they rather just run their mouth instead? Yeah, God commands a woman to learn in silence with all submission, and he does not permit a woman to teach or have authority over man but to be in silence. Silence. Still yapping your mouth, woman. You don't believe God's word. You don't believe the Bible. You're a, you're a counterfeit. You're a counterfeit. You're not a true Christian. A true Christian woman learns in silence, not try to correct a man or teach or have authority over a man. Yes, because the Bible is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And do not permit a woman to teach or ever have authority over a man, but to be in silence. To be in silence. You're obeying it. You don't believe the Bible. You don't obey the Bible. Why should anyone think you're a Christian when you don't obey the Bible? The very Bible you appeal to for your ungodliness tells you to stop it. The very Bible that you appeal to for your ungodliness tells you to stop it. Tells you to stop being ungodly. Tells you to stop running your mouth. Trying to correct men of God. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 12. Deal with it. You won't deal with it, will you? I didn't think you would. It does matter. The Bible does matter. God's Word does matter. And you ought to obey it. You ought to obey it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. You're ungodly. I don't walk in your counsel. You don't give me advice. I don't take your advice. Because you're ungodly. And because a woman does not teach or have authority over a man. You're trying to teach or have authority over a man. You're trying to correct a man. You're trying to correct a man. And the Bible says you're not supposed to do that. Let a woman learn in silence with all, the Bible say a position. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. That's what the Bible says. Well, you don't believe the Bible. You don't obey the Bible. Don't claim to be a Christian. Don't claim to be a Christian because you don't obey the Bible. I know what the Bible says. And the whole reason the Bible says that a woman should learn in silence with all submission is because you were formed second and you sinned first as a woman. That's right. Women were formed second and women sinned first. That's why you should learn in science with all submission. That's why God does not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. See, I believe in a whole Bible, not a Bible full of holes. I believe in an absolute scripture, not an obsolete scripture. So many people don't want to obey the Bible. They want to call themselves Christians and do whatever they want to do. That's not the way it works. If you think that's the way it works, you're deceived. You are deceived. The Bible says that Jesus became the author of eternal life to all those who obey him. Who obey him. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says this is the will of God. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor not in passion of lust like the Gentile who do not know God. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So when you reject as a professing Christian living a holy life, you don't reject me as a man, you reject God. You reject the Holy Spirit because God's the one who says, be holy. God's the one who says, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to your former lust. Of course, if they're former, they must be in the past and not in the present. You must have stopped doing them 
and are from the former. Not conforming yourself to your former lusts, as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct, not some, all of your conduct, for it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call upon the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself for the rest of your time of your stay here in fear, knowing you are not redeemed from your conduct received by tradition from your fathers with corruptible things like gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot, without blemish. If you realize you are redeemed from sin by Jesus, by his shed blood for you on the cross, it would cause you to cease your sinning. But many of you who profess to be Christians don't esteem, don't lift up, don't hold in high regard the sacrifice of Jesus. Search me, O oh God, and know all of my heart. Try me and know every anxious thought. See if there is any wicked part. Lead me in your Search me, O oh God, and know.